last chapter, um, Joel was talking specifically about the present day effects of sin. And I was thinking about just the homeless ministry. And you can see this when uh, you've been around people that have been just nothing but surrounded. Their life has been given totally over to sin. And it has effects on them. I think of if you're... If you're doing meth, I mean, your teeth get messed up, your skin gets messed up. If uh, you're doing alcohol, there's there's side effects to it. Your liver goes and uh, pancreas and all these things that just your body just starts giving out because of sin. But there's uh, a lot of times we don't see the effect of sin because it's more gradual. But there is a present day effect. And that's what chapter 1 was about. But then even greater to that, he starts to switch to a future kind of a problem with sin and um, I think a lot of times we, we fear our own mortality a lot, but for unbelievers, there's actually a greater fear than that. And it was uh, Matthew 10, 28, where Jesus says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear Him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And I think that's one thing that as we've gotten a, away from is uh, Pastor John did a great job teaching through hell lately, but I think we get away from that doctrine that there is there is not just the physical effects now, but there is a literal spiritual uh, consequence for sin. And especially if we don't choose Christ and change our eternal outcome, there is a huge penalty to pay. And that's kind of where uh, the, the prophet Joel is going to go through. And he's going to start pairing things to the army of Babylon. Um, if you remember Daniel, um, when he was prophesying to Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had that huge dream where the statue had four sections, the head, the chest, the legs, and then the feet. And basically it's talking about uh, the, the head was gold, and that's the army of Babylon. And as, even though Rome ruled longer, Babylon was the greatest nation ever, and it's going to say it here in the chapter, that has ever been. And the only reason they even got defeated was the son that took over from Nebuchadnezzar got cocky and he left the front door open and the Vedan army came in. And that's the only reason they lost um, in their stronghold that they were in. And they could literally last in a battle for over a year with everything they had inside, agriculturally, the water systems, um, the 100 foot walls that you could raise three chariots side by side on, on the top. So they were just massive army. And now this is 250 plus years before Babylon is coming to actually take the southern kingdom, Jerusalem, away and just drag them off to their, to their country. And here is God saying, look, you have this judgment that is coming. But I'm providing you a way out. I'm giving you a way to be redeemed. And he's crying out to them. So even though he is, he's going to judge their sin, he is still a just judge where he's coming in and saying, look, I'm giving you a way out. And that is the message as Christians that we have to carry. We have to realize that these individuals that we're talking to on a day-to-day basis, every day, they're going to pay this price one day if they take their final breath, and they don't know Jesus as their Savior. But we have to be burdened. And I know a lot of us recently have had loved ones and family members and friends who have not made that choice, and it weighs on us. But we cannot allow that to, to waver who we are in Christ and the message. It still has to go forward. So let me start with verse 1 in chapter 2. It says, Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. In Zion, in the, the Hebrew and the early language, it just meant the place of God's throne. Um, that could be, usually it was talking about the temple or the whole city of Jerusalem itself. Uh, but I want to put this in today's context. Uh, as 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? So in the context of Joel, he's saying, Blow the trumpet in all of Jerusalem where God dwells. Sound an alarm. But in our, if we're going to put this in practical sense, we are the temple and this alarm should be going off in us. And the message is the alarm should be going off anytime there's sin that's in our own camp or even close to our camp. It should be alarming us to do something about it. Uh, And then verse 2 it says, A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is a spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before, talking about the Babylonians, nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. Now this cloud of darkness... um, It's kind of a parallel back to when God would appear on Mount Sinai, when He brought the law or He brought judgment down. And the cloud would come over and it would just encompass the whole entire mountain. And it brought fear 
from the people of Israel. They literally, it was, a, it was an awestruck moment because they knew the judge had appeared. The judge that ruled them was there. So this cloud of darkness, when he talks about the when the time is coming, it's God's presence is coming near and His purpose is to be judge. Hebrews 10.31 says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So Joel is right off the bat, he's trying to wake them up. Remember, this isn't our first go around with this. This isn't the first time we've had this happen in our history. This has been going on and on and on. And it's time to wake up. You have to wake up. And there's a future judgment. And it's going to take the, in this case, it's going to take the form of the physical armies of the north coming in. And he picks it up in verse 3. He talks about how massive and how great this army is. It says, Fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. So literally, they are taking everything from wherever they go. They're taking land, they're taking lives, they're taking captive. There's nothing left. Just like those locusts in chapter 1 that it's paralleling to, there's nothing all the way down to the root has been destroyed. When they're done with the city, there is nothing left to remain except their footprints of where they've been. And he's liking this to the Garden of Eden. Um, and it just reminds me that what's going to happen, the destruction and the death that's coming from this army, is just like the fall of man. When Adam and Eve sinned and they, they disobeyed, they lost everything. God had to remove them from their land. Um, they were naked. They were ashamed. They were out in the open. And death was coming slowly, but it came. It just That's what it brought. And this army is coming in such a way that the writer Joel is paralleling it to what happened in the garden, saying, look, this is what's about to happen to us because of our sin, because of our disobedience that started with our father Adam. We're going in the same path as he did. And then verse 4 says, Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war, war horses they run. As with the rumbling of chariots they leap on the tops of the mountains like crackling of a flame of fire, devouring the stubble like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Before them peoples are in anguish, all faces grow pale. So this is where he's coming to this. God used that practical application of those locusts that came in, the physical. Everybody saw what they did and, has, and they came. It was probably when they saw them from a distance, it was a huge black cloud coming and there was nothing they could do. They couldn't harvest fast enough. They couldn't protect everything and they just lost it. And literally when this army of Babylon comes in, it's going to be, they're going to be coming over the hill just like the locusts did in such a fast pace. They're taking the hilltops and they're not even going to know what hit them when they actually come. And I just continue to think about God is talking to them them centuries before this happens. He's warning them of it, and it's just going to be utter devastation in this in this army's path. And I was thinking about, oftentimes we wonder, will God ever repay all the sin, all the things that the wrongdoing has been done, or um, those that you just, I think of the shootings and the schools, I think of... Um, all the abortions and the doctors that are just doing this and promoting it, all the politicians who think it's fine, and just millions of lives are being taken every every year because of sin. And will God ever repay that? And we have to realize, just like this army is coming, nothing is going to deter them from their, what their purpose is. Their purpose is to bring judgment on Israel, and God's justice is the same thing. We cannot stop that. It will come one day. And it says in verse 7, like warriors, they charge like soldiers. They scale the wall. They march each on his way. And that, it just reminds me, all this protection that we put up for ourselves and everything that we put our trust in, these walls and our houses and our jobs and our education, it, it, it all falls. It all falls. And when it comes time and judgment, it's going to be like they just climbed it like it wasn't even there. They do not swerve from their paths. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. And that just, it just reminds me of self-righteous individuals who, I, look, I've done all these good things. Will God really punish me if I didn't accept Jesus because I lived a moral life or I lived a good life? And I remember we were having a conversation about um, just different heresies that have happened in the church. And one of the conversations was the Mormon uh, the religion. And and one of the congregational members said, Hey, I have some really good Mormon friends. Let's not talk about them that way. And it took me by surprise for a second, but I had to respond. Well, it's not about them being nice people. 
I have relatives that are nice people, but they haven't accepted Jesus yet as their Savior. And if, if they don't do that, we know what's going to happen. So it's not about being nice or respectful. It's about the truth. It's, it's, and it's a hard truth to swallow. And that's what Joel is passing on to the Israelites, saying, Look, it's time to wake up, guys. This is coming. How long are we going to be like the foolish virgins and just not prepare for the bridegroom? How long are we going to sit like this and do nothing in our lives? Um, and that's what he's talking about. This army will not be thwarted when it comes. And, ju- and God will judge all mankind one day. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed for, one, for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So it will happen. He is a faithful judge, but he's a just judge. Verse 10 says, The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, the stars withdraw their shining, the Lord utters His voice before His army, for His camp is exceedingly great. He who executes His word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Return to the Lord. And on that day, I was just thinking, when all this chaos, that everything that's going on, we we're reading about the martyrs who just lost their life to ISIS in August, and it, it, it just seems like it's just totally chaotic and it's out of place and what's going on. But literally, when this event happens, when God judges everything, the only way this cosmic just shaking is that the God of the universe has come on the scene to handle all this, and it just comes right back into place. And at this point, when the Holy Spirit is speaking through Joel, and he's, he's prophesying this, Joel cries out. Joel's crying out, Return to the Lord. This is physically Joel just seeing, Look, this is an imminent judgment. And as a prophet, as an ambassador of God, I have to call you, return to the Lord, don't walk away from Him. This is just an emotional response by Him that, look, this is my job, this is what I'm here for, and come back to the Lord. And is that our reaction when we think about everything that's going on, when we, do we get too cried at, too caught up in the, the normal things of the world, going to work, going to school, or even going to church. Um, I think the biggest shock to me was when Nathaniel came to me a couple years ago, and he really said to me, he's like, Dad, I, I don't know how to witness, or I don't have an opportunity to witness. I'm like, we're always witnessing. He's like, no, all my friends are Christians, all my uh, people I go to school with are Christians, I'm around you guys, I don't see any sinners. And I realized that like in a two-year process, I had stepped away from actually putting ourselves in front of people who need us the most, which are non-Christians, non-believers, those that are heading to hell. And we have to have that reaction, remind ourselves, stir ourselves up of what God is warning of, that this is coming. But just like He did for Joel centuries before, it's been 2,000 years and God is continuing to say, look, I have grace now. Now is the day of salvation. Don't, don't wait till tomorrow. And that should be our call to everyone. Return to the Lord. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 18-19 says, All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting the trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of re- reconciliation. That is our ministry. That is why we are here to reconcile sinners to God. Discipleship is part of that, but even why we do discipleship is to teach the next person how to reconcile a sinner back to God. That's our purpose. That's why we're discipling them, not to make them look better or look more like a Christian or what a church should look like. It's we need to look like Jesus to everyone so that way I can send that person out and they can be a ministry of reconciliation to God uh, for people to, to come to Christ. And I'm so I'm just thankful that as we deserve this judgment. But we have a God who is continuing saying, look, this is the destructive path you're heading down, but you don't have to go there. You don't. He, he just allows grace. He makes a way out, and it's in repentance. Now, we had, we had Joel cry out, return to the Lord, and now the Holy Spirit has come back upon him, and actually God starts talking through him. So I want you to see, return to the Lord, that's Joel's emotion as an ambassador for God, saying, look, come back to the Lord. Don't go down that path. And now God comes out and He makes the same plea in verse 12. He says, Yet even now, declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. So, He wasn't looking for an outward physical show of repentance. He wasn't looking for, Okay, I'm scared of hell. 
Let's just go through the motions so we can get back on God's good side. He's saying, rent your hearts, not your outward garments. I want a relationship with you. I don't want you to be, do this going through the motions. As, as we're intimate sitting here tonight, that's what God is calling us and everybody else to be, is to be an intimate relationship with Him. John 6.40 says, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day, that judgment day, that yes, judgment, our bodies will be one day we, we have to die, like Hebrews said, but we don't have to die the same death departed from Him. We get to be with Him. We get to live eternal with Him in a new body, a new, a new life, all together with Him. He wants our heart, and that's His motivation behind all this. This seemingly harsh judgment that He's bringing on Israel is so that He can recon- have them recognize physically here now what's going to happen eternal and spiritually for them if they don't turn back to Him. So that's His motivation is that He loves us. Um, he goes on to say, Return to the Lord. So this is God talking. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and He relents over disaster. So you have this intense picture of this army that's coming. This intense picture that it, it's a symbolic of the judgment, that, the wrath that God is coming for, to deliver at the last day, but it's also this picture of hope. He's saying, Look, it doesn't have to go this way. I will relent. I, I, I desire it more than you do. I'm slow to get angry about this. But I'm warning you centuries before it happens to wake up. Wake up. And this is our hope that all the wrath that God had for sin is not poured out on us as believers. It was poured out on Jesus. That we don't have to worry about any of that any longer. It says in Romans 3.24-25, We are justified by His grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith, this was to show God's righteousness, because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. All the old is gone. It was to show His righteousness as the present time, so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So even though he, He's got to judge sin, He's still a just judge, saying, look, you can turn from this. You can turn from it at any time. Just turn to me. Love me for just me. Love me for relenting on this. In the Old Testament, I always say it can be alarming to read this, and God looks like He's so harsh sometimes. But that's a temporary correction of, of an eternal problem. His eternal fix is more alarming. It is, it is a, it's a scary thing to be caught in the arms of the Lord and not know Him. Um, and that's where a lot of people's focus when we're talking to non-believers. They focus on this harsh God, but they miss these scriptures because they pull one and say, Look, I can't serve a God that this is this harsh. But He is such a gracious God to saying, Look, I will relent from this. And there's a th- when, we, when we shy away from talking about the eternal things, we lose a precious moment in evangelism. We can't be afraid to share. Hey, look, it, it's more than just, you know, Jesus loves you and He died for you. Well, why did He die for you? So that you don't have to face what's coming. You don't have to face this. As believers, we don't have to shy away from this. And this is what Joel's going to show us here, is he's taking them down his path as he's evangelizing them. And he's saying, look, I move from now the physical, a logical conversation about what's going on in your life and why you're having issues. Let's talk about the spiritual and the futuristic uh, problems that you're going to have through this and the eternal problems you're going to have through this. And it should evoke a response. So look at verse 14. It says, Who knows whether he will not turn and relent? and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Again, we're the temple. We we are that person now. That alarm should be going off. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. I think about when the disciples went out and they were facing hard uh, problems and there was demonic activity and they, they came back and said Jesus why couldn't we cast this one out why why did that not work for us and he said these only come out through fasting and prayer um, as we see things do we call ourselves to fast and pray again do we get on our knees saying look God you're calling us to Tacoma 
And every pastor I talk to, literally they're saying, I don't know if there's hope for the city. I don't know if there's really hope. Can God really move? And there's a few that still say, nope, He can do it. Let's get on our knees together. Let's, let's just pray because we know we've tried every program. We've tried everything. And it just programs don't work. It has to be God to do this. And He says in verse 16, Gather the people, consecrate a congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. That mirrors the first chapter. He said just when the, 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 the bride was going to her wedding day and we should be mourning as if we just lost her husband. But the imagery in this one is, look, the gospel message is such a thing that needs to go out in this lost and dying world that we as Christians cannot go on as life as usual. That is not our call. It has never been our call. It should never be something that we accept or become complacent about. We live an unusual life that has a purpose and is to bring the gospel. And I remember in Luke 9 when Jesus was just walking and there were individuals saying, Look, I, I want to follow you. And this is what he said. He says, As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. It doesn't say that he went on with him. Verse 59 says, To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me go first and, and go and bury my father. And I used to think that was harsh, but that, that young man was wanting his inheritance from his father. Let me, let me stay until my father's dead and I get my inheritance. And once I have cash in my pocket, then I'll go with you. I'll serve you full, full because I don't, need, I don't want to trust in you because you don't have anywhere to lay your head. I want somewhere to lay mine. And it goes on and says, And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their, de- their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. And it's just literally, as Christians, as believers, we are called to be unusual. We are not called to be the status quo. We are not called to be lost in the day-to-day things. This should be our focus when we wake up. God, how can I proclaim to everyone I meet today, return to you? And I'm first and foremost saying, I I get caught in even the day-to-day ministry things. Just, this is what's on my list. This is what I got to get done. And I lose focus of this a lot. And this should be our focus every day. Not even just ministry, not work, not education, not our families. Those are all important and God gave them to us to take care of. But this has to be the focus. This has to be our purpose. And it's it, literally, it, it's hard to live that higher purpose, but it's what we're called to do. Uh, verse 17 says, Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord. And make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the, the peoples, where is their God? So he's just calling, he's calling God out. I love this. This is, he's prophesying and all of a sudden he says, look, I got to step in and advocate because these guys are not waking up. I got to be on my knees and interceding for them, for the Lord to move in their lives. And I think about Moses did that um, for the children of Israel. He asked God to relent. Abraham did that when... Um, even Sodom and Gomorrah, may, may we find 50 people, 40 people, 30 people. Would you still do this? But these are the men that stepped up and said, Spare the people, God. Spare them. And they use that word spare, but it reminds us that we are deserving of the punishment. Sinners are deserving of the punishment, but spare them, Lord. Give us more time. Uh, the early church used to use the saying, Maranatha, the Lord return quickly. And I think that I, it's a good word, and I understand what they were meaning because the, the persecution was so hard. But I think we should be praying, God, give us more time. Give us more time to, to minister to people. Give us more time to be evangelists and actually be about the Father's business. As true believers, we got to be focused on winning souls. Um, Bible studies are great, but it has to be to equip us to go out and win souls. We have to be able to do that. And Joel finishes by, with his prayer, he's actually praying for national revival. Now that's, that's the response that thinking about hell, thinking about the destruction that's coming, he doesn't get shaken. He doesn't say, oh, what a horrible God that we have or punisher. He sees that God is offering to relent. He's offering grace. And what he prays for is people to wake up and to get about the Father's business. So he prays about uh, revival. And a couple great uh, Christian authors, Henry Blackaby says, All revival begins and continues in the prayer meeting. 
Some also have called, sorry, some have also called prayer the great fruit of revival. In times of revival, thousands may be found on their knees for hours, lifting up their heartfelt cries with thanksgiving to heaven. Charles Finney writes, A revival is nothing else than a new beginning of obedience to God. Andrew Murray says, The coming revival must begin with a great revival of prayer. It is in the closet with the door shut that the sound of abundance of rain will first be heard. An increase of secret prayer with ministers will be the sure harboring of blessings. So again, we're getting back to you. This is what happened. Joel knows it. If we want God to move in our city, our family, in our personal lives, if, he's, if, if we're saying, God, what do I need to do in ministry? Where is He calling us? What's my, my purpose? It only begins with prayer. It only begins with that. It has to start with that. And that's when the true refreshing and a movement of God is coming is when it's saturated by prayer. And I want to challenge you guys as a church. I want to commit myself because I'm not there yet. But I want you guys to commit alongside of me that we will intercede for revival in Tacoma. And not just Tacoma, but our nation, our world needs it. And that should be the, the boldness that we have to call people to repentance. To absolutely step out and never forget ourselves that we need a repentance. We need that every single day. And, and remind, this is what's spurring Joel. Joel, I, he sees that he's right there with him. He knows his tendencies. He knows his flesh. He knows his heart. And he's saying, but by the grace of God, I would be in this mix too. That's why he's, he's crying out, God, thank you. Return to the Lord. Return to the Lord. And it should, it should invoke emotional response. I, I don't know. Um, I, I've kind of went back and forth with different ministers and said, well, I don't want to lead people to the Lord and be an emotional thing. Well, love is an emotion. To experience love from God for the first time should invoke motion, emotion in us. And to be stirred by Him should evoke emotion in us. Um, God, Jesus was emotional every time He got around people. Sometimes He was angry at sin. Sometimes He was uh, crying over the situation of hurt and pain. But all those emotions led Him to do what? Evangelize and to heal and bring, bring the good news. And the same thing with the disciples. He did not let it face or phase them at all. And that's what God is offering in, in this book that I've seen so far. And the one of the reasons I want to do that, this was the first message on the day of Pentecost. Who did Peter quote? The prophet of Joel. On this day, the, the, the day of the Lord's coming, darkness and gloom. And it was reminding them, look, Joel's been speaking of this. It's 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 centuries later, guys. Why aren't we why aren't we why aren't we there yet? 900 years later, why aren't we here? Why haven't we woke up yet? Why is He still having to come down and call that same message? So I wanted to pray tonight, and then I wanted to talk about just what does it look like revival? What does it look like with um, the rubber meets the road? What, is, what does evangelism look like? So let's pray, and then we'll get into that. Lord, we just thank You so much tonight for Your Word. I thank You for the message that sin will have to be judged. But that is not, it does not have to be the last word. It does not have to be how it ends for everyone. And I thank you, God, that you said, Repent, and I will relent. I, it doesn't have to come. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, all of us sitting in this room have experienced that grace, that we have experienced that love, and we have experienced that own forgiveness in our lives. But God, don't let it stop there. Don't let us just experience it for ourselves. God, give us that burden. These prophets of old, these disciples, these apostles who stood up and said, Repent, the Lord is coming. The Lord is drawing near. Don't go down that path, God. Wake us up in this church, this city, this state, this, this country, this nation to revive us again of why we're here. And God, I just, I just look at our brothers and sisters being persecuted overseas and they're just standing in the gap saying, I'm going to be here evangelizing these people even in the face of death. Even in the face of death, God. And all we, all we face in America so far is a, a disagreement or a no. God, I pray that we would just rise above that and boldness would come upon us, God, and, and not take no for an answer. But we're still going to love people. And God, I just pray that you would just start with us in our own hearts, our own lives, especially me as, as the pastor. God, that we would fall to our knees, that there would be calluses on our knees because we spend so much time with you, Lord. God, let it just get back to that point where we are just saturated in prayer. And God, like the writer said, that we would hear the rain coming. God, let it come. And Lord, we just ask this in your name. Amen.